Before anything else, I'd just like maybe to add something about the, the book, uh, the tool shed. You know, uh, many, many, when I, when I was a growing Christian, I was leading a group for the first time. I, I wondered what could I use to help or to teach uh, the ones that I was leading to Christ. And so what I found was that was tr- really helpful and tremendously helpful for my life was these ma- materials, tools, I say, because I believe God has given the church the gift. And one of the gifts God has given the church is the gift of teaching. And the teachings aim, the gift of teaching aims to equip the saints for the ministry to establish him towards maturity so that the, 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 the saint will now know what to do, right? That he is now mature in the Lord. So we believe books are wonderful teachers. So if you've been wondering, what, what could I teach my, my wider group? We will be make available more and more resources there in the Cebuana version and in the English version. We would be printing our own materials as well. We would be accumulating local books booklets uh, as well. Right now, what we have in stock are books that we ordered two months ago in Amazon in, in the U.S. So we ordered it by book and it arrived after two months. Later on, we will be open to pre-orders or ordering where we will help you if you need some books that are so hard to find here in the Philippines or in Cagayan de Oro. We will open up a, an ordering system where you can order books here and then all you have to do is just uh, sign up, reorder, pay for it, and then wait for two months, it'll be here. So we want to make it accessible for everybody. If you need Bibles and all, uh, we will soon stock those up as well in the tool shed. Now, if, uh, for the past three months, GCAF has been tackling the book of Matthews. And Lord willing, we will be going through the whole book uh, for the next for a long time, right? If the Lord permits us. Uh, and what we hope is that we're going through the book of Matthew right now, verse by verse. We started at chapter 5. We are now at chapter 9. I'll read the verse for us and ask the Lord for help for everyone here afterwards. So Matthew 9, 14 to 17. Verse 14 opens up with this. Then John's disciples came and ask him, Jesus, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one, saw, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No. They pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Let's take this time to pray. Lord, we just sang a wonderful song. I was really amazed by how the songwriter wrote that, Holy, holy are you, O Lord God Almighty. Worthy is your name. And even... Heaven, all of heaven joins the universe in crying how worthy you are. That even the brightest minds of man cannot begin to comprehend your glory, how amazing you are, how gracious you are. All your attributes, even your name is so wonderful. And so, though we barely comprehend, the song writes, that even a glimpse, as Moses discovered, even a glimpse of your back, seeing the glory, compels us to sing out, compels us to praise your name for how glorious you are. Be with us this evening, O Lord, as we listen now to your glorious word. 
How wonderful it is, O oh Lord, that in, even in this, it is precious to us, to our lives. Speak to each and every one of us here in this room, whatever we are facing in our lives, may your word minister to each and every one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, what's going on here? I'd like to call this, first and foremost, I'd like to title this message, A New Kind of Relationship. A New Kind of Relationship. And what's going on in Matthew 9, 14 to 17 is that there is a group, another group that's approaching, that approached Jesus. This is the third group. If you've been with us since chapter 5, this is the third group that's, that's approached Jesus with an offense. They're offended at Jesus. And the first group, if you remember, these were the scribes, the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees was the first group. The second group was the scribes. This now is the third group, the disciples of John. Which John is this? This is not the same John that wrote the, the gospel of John. This is John the Baptist, and he has disciples. So before I go on, maybe I'd like to... Um, explain a little bit. Who is this John the Baptist that he has disciples and that they're approaching Jesus and they have an offense? They're offended with something. Well, first and foremost, John the Baptist, uh, as Mark 1, 2 to 4 records, is this. John the Baptist is a messenger. His whole life, he has been called by God even before he was born. He had a special calling. John the Baptist was going to be the messenger of the Messiah. That was his calling for life. That was his whole mission. His whole mission was to prepare the way for the Lord. And his lifestyle was not going to be an ordinary person's lifestyle. His lifestyle was going to be something that would show the world that he, this was different, that, that his life was different. Because he was going to say and proclaim a message that was different. And that he was going to say, he was, all his, his, his duty was this, to prepare the way of the one that would be much greater than him. And this, his, his mis ministry was going to be a call for people to repent from whatever they were trusting in, to repent from their sins, and so they would turn back to the Lord and be baptized. That's why his ministry is... He's, he's called John the Baptist because he was baptizing a lot of people in the Jordan River. And so we see that he, even his clothes, what he would wear was something different. All he would ever wear would be made out of coarse camel hair. And let me tell you, that's not comfortable at all. That's rough. That's, that's, that trickles the skin, right? That tickles the skin and it, maybe a lot of rashes are there. And his lifestyle is so simple that he eats only locusts and wild honey, says Mark, Matthew 3, verse 4. So even if you invited him to the best restaurants, you'd treat him out for whatever, he would have to say no because his lifestyle has been set for him. That he's going to be, his role, his mission, that his one and only Desire and mission in this world was going to be prepared to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, the Messiah that would come. This is John the Baptist. And because he has a, a, his ministry was so effective, what happens here in Matthew 3, verse 5, people from everywhere, people from near and far, from Jerusalem, from all over Judea, from all over from J Jordan Valley even, they are coming near and far just to see and listen to this wonderful man, this messenger, because he's preaching something so powerful. His life is an example that is so powerful. He, he's, an, he's got an, a certain degree of authority in him that, that is very hard to find, and his message is convicting. And that's why in verse 6, when people come to hear him, his message, they confess their sins. They realize they have been sinning. They have been error in the, in the eyes of the Lord. And they repent and turn to the Lord. And John the Baptist then baptizes them 
in the Jordan River. And by this ministry, he, certain men and women come now to him and ask, can we follow you, John the Baptist? Can we learn from you? And so this is how John the Baptist himself gets disciples, followers, learners. That is the meaning of the word disciple. And so the story of Matthew 9, verses 14 to 17, happens after John the Baptist has been arrested. He got arrested by the king because John the Baptist is so bold in his ministry, he even confronts the king with his sin. And the king is so mad, he throws John the Baptist in jail, and this is now the situation. The whole ministry and aim of John the Baptist is to prepare the way for Jesus Christ his teaching, he even recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. And yet, we now come to the story that not everybody that followed John, not everybody that listened to John, they were so close, right? They were following the one, the messenger that was going to prepare the way for the Lord, and yet, they did not even recognize Jesus. And what's worse, they even got offended at Jesus Christ over something. What was there? What was there something that they had a problem with Jesus Christ? But before I answer that question, I have to ask you a question. What would get in the way of you believing in Jesus Christ? What would get in your the way of your heart, in the way of your mind, that you would have a hard time to believe in the words of Jesus, to believe in the authority of Jesus, to believe in the power of Jesus Christ. And I tell you, in this, everybody in this room, we have certain areas in our life that even till today, we find very hard to trust in Jesus. Everybody here has one at least one or many areas in our life that situations come that we then have a hard time trusting in Jesus. So I'm asking you this question. What makes it hard for you to believe in Jesus? What would make it difficult that you would have a hard time trusting in Jesus? Even though in many areas you've already seen His power, even though you've, in many ways you've seen how good He is, how trustworthy He is, how He can keep His promises, and still struggle in certain areas of our life to trust in Jesus. In this story, there is at least two, two reasons. Two reasons why these groups of people found it hard to believe in Jesus Christ. And they even got so mad about it. First reason is this. When you have misplaced loyalty, when your loyalty is put in a person, in a certain family clan, in a certain idea or a notion, what we call today as a worldview, when it comes to now having to choose, should I trust in what I've known? Should I trust in my experience or in this words of Jesus Christ, Scripture, the Bible? Many find it hard to believe in Jesus. Why? Because their loyalty has been misplaced. I've, I've, I've found it, Nona, even ministry, Many people's loyalty is now transferred to a certain ministry, to a certain way of doing things, a certain way of, of understanding things, so that when they're now challenged, that's not how Jesus does it. That's not how, what Jesus taught. They would have a hard time believing that. Why? Because they've held on for so long for, with this type of thinking. They've formed a bond that, that says, well, I have to be loyal to this first before anything else. And so, it becomes a conflict. And this is what happened 
in the group of disciples of John the Baptist. You see, there's another story here. In John 3, 26, John's disciples again are here. And what's going on in this certain part of Scripture is this. John 3, 26 records this is the time after John the Baptist has baptized Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes to John and says, John, baptize me for I, for, in order to fulfill all righteousness. And John the Baptist is saying, no, you're the one. You're the one who's supposed to baptize me. I'm not even worthy to tie up your sandals. But Jesus insists because it is the right thing to do to fulfill all righteousness. And so John, John the Baptist says, okay, I'll baptize you. But you are the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. You are the one that must grow and I must be grow lesser. Right? But the disciples of John, after this incident, Jesus goes across the river. So he's pretty nearby where John is doing his ministry. And now Jesus is starting his own ministry. He's now teaching. He's now calling people to repentance. And guess what? When the group, when this group, John the Baptist's disciples see Jesus having a quote-unquote competing ministry, John, they're, they're so mad. They go to Jesus and say, and John the Baptist say, John, look, you know what? That guy that you just baptized, the one you, you recognize as Messiah, he's starting a ministry like yours. He's, he's competing. You know what's going to happen? More people are going to go to him. Our ministry is going to get affected. We're going to dwindle down. Stop him. You know what's going on here? Have they been listening? To John, John's been preaching this. The Messiah is coming. He's going to be greater than me. My ministry is not going to be here forever. My single role in life. That's the message of John. And yet, you know what? The, the loyalty, the loyalty of John's disciples are on John. They put it on John. And so when they see this, they don't even recognize Jesus. They get mad at him for starting his own ministry, his ministry, wherein they should have been rejoicing. When you have misplaced loyalty over a worldview, well, that, that's true for you, but not for me. Let's just agree to disagree. That's a worldview. And if your loyalty is in that worldview, you would have a hard time when Jesus says, there is only one way to God the Father. There's only one gate to enter in. And if you've put your loyalty in uh, the notion that all religion will just reach to God, you know, just take whatever you want, believe in something, whatever it is, we'll reach heaven anyways. You would have a hard time believing in Jesus Christ the Lord that says, there's only one way, only one way. Why? Because you have put something, your loyalty over even that of Jesus Christ. The second thing that would make it hard for you to believe that's also present in the story is this. When you not only misplace your loyalty, you misplace your trust. And where has your trust gone? The tendency for many people that are, in, we're living in a Christian nation is this. It will go, your trust will go to a religious tradition or a ritual. You know, I have a, a story. My childhood was in the 80s. You know, I was born in 1979. And uh, so I basically, my childhood, my early childhood is in the 80s. During the 80s, I, I now discover that I have oily skin. I'm growing up, I have no idea what it is. I don't even care. But... All of a sudden, when you're grade five, and you have the first crush on your life, and you look in the mirror, and to your horror, you see red, red dots on your face that makes you look, oh, I'm so ugly, you know? I have all these red, red pimples and all. I got so conscious. And because, you know, growing up in the 80s, you don't have the internet. You have no available uh, resources that 
tells you how to take care of your skin, how to, you know, do all that. I had to rely on my dear teachers in life. My uncles, my aunties, my friends, they were the ones teaching me how. So here's one uncle that said, I, I, this is a special moment in my life. I never forget this. One uncle, you know, gave me a wonderful advice. You know what, Dave? If you want your pimples removed, use perla. And if you're growing up in the 80s or even the 90s, maybe you've seen the television advertisement where his, the, the lady, you know, by, by the way, Perla is a laundry soap. And my uncle says, use laundry soap to get rid of all your pimples, you know. Uh, and there's this TV ad that, that you know, when you're, the, 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 the lady is washing, even her hands are glowing. It's so soft now, right? So here I am, grade five, all of me, and I buy into that. Say, okay, I will every day wash my face with Perla, right? Why? Because I want to, you know, remove this pimple so that my crush will get impressed with me, you know? And you know what? It didn't work. Okay. So the next thing, the next advisor comes into my life and says, you know what? Perla doesn't work. Use lactacid. I actually believed in that, but here's the thing. He said, don't use the red one, the pink one. Use the blue one, right? And so I didn't even know what lactacid was for, right? I didn't even know what it was for. He said, okay, I was desperate. Okay, give me that. I'll, I'll use that. Every day, I'm washing my, ha- my face with blue, the blue labeled lactacid, okay? And, you know, I remember this. I, I remember thinking, mm, it smells kind of nice, <laughs> <laughs> but it, somehow, as I tried to, you know, clean up my face, my pimples, I, dis- I, I developed a ritual. I developed my daily ritual that this would be, you know, I discovered Eskinol Masters, you know, Secreto ng mga guapo, and, you know, uh, I use it, I do all that. I've been using all of it, and for, after a decade, you know, by, by the time I think I was in college, my skin... My face, my oily skin was now partly dry. I, I, it would dry up. When I, I realized that there would be parts of my face that it would now scale, uh, you know, peel off. It was now dry. So I had to add to my ritual. I had to add to my tradition, morning tradition, moisturizer. And as I discovered that not only... Dilit lang basta basta na moisturizer will work for me. I tried Cetaphil, I tried the cheaper ones. I discovered the only moisturizer that worked for me was Olay. You know? So nothing touches my face now except Olay. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll, my, my face will start to peel again. And so, what, uh, but this is what I discovered with my rituals. That there would, it, it's, it's a cycling, it's cycling uh, re- repeating cycle, I mean. There would be once and again, once in a while, I would start to think, maybe I don't need to do this anymore. You know, I've tried to do this. I, I don't need this anymore. And so I would stop. And after a few days, I would, I would, my skin would again start to dry and it would then start to peel. I have to go back to doing the ritual again. There's also another thing that I've discovered as I've been trying to do my rituals is this. There is a tendency that it becomes automatic. It's something that I've even, I don't even feel like doing it. But you know, because it's something that I've grown used to, I do it anyways. And there's like, oh, uh, I just, you know, do whatever it is, haphazardly, rushedly, or even sometimes I'm forced to do it, irritated to do it, but I do it anyways. And so there's no, that's what I discovered when I'm doing rituals. And you know what? That's not limited only to beauty regimen rituals. It is also the same when it comes to religious traditions or rituals. The tendency for somebody that has grown up in a religious tradition doing a, a ritual is this. They will somehow think, or forget, why am I doing the ritual? And it would, it would lose its meaning. They would, they would think, well, this is what I was taught, so I, they, would, they would do it, 
but they don't understand what they're doing anymore. This, the, other, the other tradition, um, the other tendency for religious rituals would be is this, that they would be doing it and then it would then make them think that it is the reason why they are right with the Lord. It would be like me with my morning traditions and ritual, putting on my Eskinol, putting on my moisturizer, and, and then saying to myself, it's because of Eskinol, it's because of Olay that I'm so guapo. Right? I'm now giving credit to my ritual that, that this God-given face is handsome. Right? And I forget to credit God. By the way, my wife is the only one that, you know, is so in love with me. So, uh, forgive me for that. Anyway, um, when you put trust in religious traditions and rituals over that of God, you would have a hard time believing in Jesus. Story here is this in Matthew 9 14. This group, this group of disciples of John the Baptist, they come to Jesus and they're mad about something. What are they mad about? They're saying, How come, Jesus, that your disciples are not fasting while we and even the Pharisees, we're seeing eye to eye in this. We are fasting. And they're offended that Jesus and His disciples are not following their religious rituals. You know, that is a tendency, another tendency for a religious ritual. What is a religious ritual or a tradition that we have here in GCAF? Every Wednesday, we have this, what we call prayer and fasting. By the way, traditions and rituals are good. They have a wonderful purpose if it is in accordance to what it, what it is meant to be. Rituals and traditions, God has ordained many in the Old Testament. What is the purpose for a ritual or tradition that God would teach His people? It was to serve as a reminder. Israel, do this, do this, celebrate this. Celebrate Passover, make this a tradition, teach it to your, to your children. Why? To remember how the Lord's faithfulness took you out of Egypt. So every time the Lord would teach His people to do a tradition, to, to have a religious ceremony, a religious ritual, it was always so that the people will be taught how Amazing God is, how wonderful God is. But see, there is a danger to rituals, to religious traditions. And what is that? One of that is this. Here in GCAF, every Wednesday night, we have a tradition. We call it the prayer meeting. And we've been inviting people. And by all means, come and pray corporately. It is what that we desperately need in this world to pray as, as a family, Right? But here's the danger, because when people come here and observe the religious ritual of coming together to pray, there is a tendency to look up and look around, to look around in the room and then say to our heart and to our mind, you know what, I'm here every Wednesday. I must be a very prayerful person. And I look around the room and I see somebody, an empty seat. Oh, that person's not there. He's not prayerful. Oh, that person, oh, and everything is happening. Why? Because the where's, the where's the trust going? The trust is now going to re, the religious ritual. You have now gotten off track. You've now somehow missed the point of the religious ritual, that it is never meant to look engaged at others by what we do. So here, they're offended. Why are the disciples of John the Baptist offended? Because John's disciples are fasting and they look at the disciples of Jesus and they're eating and they're so mad. They're judging Jesus. But let me say, what's fasting, by the way? 
So a quick 101 for fasting is this. Every time the Bible mentions fasting, it means going without food. Stop eating. Don't, don't, eat, don't eat, don't drink for a period. And it's not just merely refra- refraining from certain foods. Because even the hospital, right, the world recognizes fasting. So when the Bible says, when people fast, when, when the Bible asks or mentions about fasting, it is always, always associated with prayer. And the fasting is, happens in, always in response to an occasion. There's always a reason, in other words. There is always a re- reason for the tradition, for the ritual. And it's always in the, with an attitude of grief. Grief over a certain degree of sin or sinfulness or sorrow for having lost a loved one. Humility, humbling the people humbling before the, themselves before the Lord and, and recognizing we're going to forego eating, we're going to forego drinking. We just want to go to the Lord and ask and in all humility. It's always in the attitude either also with repentance or desperation. That's what the Bible always connects with biblical fasting. It's not just merely stopping eating, stop, stop drinking for a day. It's always with prayer and a certain right attitude that comes with it in response to an occasion. Examples for that would be in 1 Samuel 31.13 where there is grief here, great grief. They have lost a loved one and they've, as a result of this occasion, they fast for seven days. In Daniel 9.3, Daniel himself goes to fasting because he's pleading with God. He's going to God and asking, Lord, can you, I have many petitions. Help me, oh Lord, I'm fasting. And he's even, you know, putting on sackcloth and ashes, which was symbol of, symbols of repentance, of sorrow, grief, and humility. So we've seen that in the Bible, there's Individuals who fast, personal fasting. It's also in the Bible that as a group, either as a nation, as a family, as a, a kingdom, as a, a group, they call it the corporate fasting. And, and this is present as well in the Bible. So here in GCAF, we encourage corporate fasting every quarter so that we could come together and pray as a spiritual family together. And that's good. But see, here's one thing I think is of noteworthy. In the Old Testament, there is only one, one day that the Lord commanded Israel to fast. One day, the Lord only commanded, this is mandatory, you must fast during this day. They call it the Day of Atonement. But you know what? During Jesus' days, they had added to that. It was no longer one day a year that they required fasting. If you were a holy man, if you were somebody that aimed to be religious, to be a, a good Jew, you would have to fast two days a week. They had now added something. They have now made it into just a mere ritual. You have to fast two days a week, whether you have a good reason or not. You have to fast. Why? This is our tradition. This is our ritual. This is now a barometer if you are holy or not. And so, in Mark 2, 18, when it records the same story in Mark 9, in Matthew 9, when John's disciples and the Pharisees, what were they doing? They were fasting. And they see Jesus and His disciples and they're eating, they're feasting. They're mad. They're, they're saying, Jesus, you're not a holy man. Your disciples, you're not holy. You guys, you guys are sinful. You must not be fasting. So that's, that's their, their accusation against Jesus. But you know what was amazing about this? Is that Jesus did fast. Matthew 4, 2, remember? Matthew 4, 2, this is the day, the 40 days of fasting Jesus did. He goes by himself. Jesus, when he fasted, he didn't tell anybody. He never, he never told anybody, I'm going to fast for 40 days. Because you know what? 
the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist and the rituals of fasting during that time is this. When you fast, when the religious Pharisees fasted, they had to wear special clothing so that people would not notice that they were fasting. And not only would they wear something special so that people would recognize their fasting, they would also make their face look sad and serious. You know what, like this? And then many people would ask, hey, what's wrong? I'm fasting. Yep. They're walking in a solemn manner and they're, they're like, oh, life's so hard. I must go on. And many people would ask, what's going on? Are you, are you okay, bro? And he would say, I'm fasting. Eh. Right? Why? What's the intent here? To show people that they're holy. That they show people that they're fasting. To announce to as much as they can. Why? Because during their days, this is a barometer now if you're a holy man or not. And so if you announce, hey, this, you know what? This is my third day of fasting. And people will say, oh, oh amazing. Many people just only fast two times a week. You've fasted three days. Uh-huh, yeah, right. I've got so many things to pray for. Right? And when, when they would pray, there were three virtues during their days. Praying, almsgiving, and fasting. You know what? And they would pray, this holy man, they won't pray just anywhere. They would pray intentionally in a corner of a street or in the middle of a street. Imagine that. They would pray aloud, oh God, and all that. Why? So that people would say, wow, this is a holy man. You know, he's praying aloud, so bold. Wow. Right? That's what's going on. And Jesus is turning it upside down. He goes fasting for 40 days, and he doesn't tell anybody. So nobody knew. Nobody saw. And he, what's the accusation? What's the accusation? Jesus, we're seeing you keep eating and eating. You must not be fa- You don't fast. You, you, you are, you're not a holy man. That's the accusation. But not only is Jesus, did Jesus fast, Jesus also taught. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus also taught his disciples the same thing. He's saying in, in Matthew 6, whenever you fast, whenever you fast. So don't believe in some pastor or preacher that tells you Jesus abolished and said fasting is, is just Old Testament stuff. It's no longer relevant. Jesus is teaching whenever you would fast. Do not put on a gloomy face. You remember Matthew? Matthew makes it a point that Jesus has come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law of the prophets, meaning the Old Testament. He's, Jesus has not abolished it. He's fulfilled everything written in the Old Testament. And fasting now, he's saying to his disciples, whenever you fast, don't do it like the hypocrites do. Who, who are the hypocrites during his time? The Pharisees, and yes, even that of the, dis, the disciples of John. And how they did it. See, when they would fast, they would neglect their appearance, make it so that they would be noticed by men and they would be praised by men. But here's what Jesus teaches them don't fast like that, fast in secret, so that your fasting will, won't be seen by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what you're doing in secret will be the one to reward you. Watch out. Watch out for flamboyant forms of religiosity, of religious people that dis- likes to display what they're doing. Because there might underlie underneath that visible flamboyant act of righteous acts, something sick, just like the hearts of the Pharisees. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, what can you expect from this today? What can you expect? I tell you, you can expect three things. Because Jesus said, if this happens to me, the master, everybody that would follow after me, every disciple I have will experience the same thing. Number one, expect to be misunderstood. When you follow Jesus, when you obey Jesus in all things, you expect that people will misunderstand you. I've heard many stories, you know, 
uh, when, when, bef- when this guy was, before he was a Christian, he would have this, all his friends, they would party a lot, they would drink a lot. When he became a Christian, he said, I, I no longer want to drink. I no longer want to do those things. I realize now, I just want to follow Jesus. So he says, I don't want to drink anymore. You know what? His friends, his barcada, his childhood friends told him, they said so many hurtful things about him. Di ka makikpasama, iba ka na, wala na ka, di na ka ma-reach. And they, they said that he was betraying them. You know, what was he doing? What was he doing? He was just saying, I'm not going to drink anymore, guys. And he was mis- misunderstood. And so if your loyalty, if your trust has been placed in something else, when you are misunderstood in this world, when you are misunderstood by friends, when you're misunderstood by family, you will be shaken. You will say, oh, this isn't worth it. And you will cry out and you will do something. Why? Because you, re- you realize, you have to realize, if you put your trust, if you put your loyalty in something else, you will always get shaken in life. Second thing that you must expect for you to ha- that, uh, that would happen to you is this. Expect that people will, uh, will not appreciate what you're doing. No matter how ma- much good you've done, Jesus, He's been healing many people. Everybody in this story, right? Remember Matthew 8 and even in chapter 9? He's been doing ministry. He's been teaching left and right. He's been accepting people who are sick, lame, crippled, blind, uh, demon-possessed. And He's been helping so many. And yet, these people come to Jesus, sees Him not matching their religious standards, and they're saying, Baliwala, tanan, you, we don't appreciate you. Right? All we see is this, that we're so mad at you for not doing this. You're going to be unappreciated in life, my dear friends, even when you're doing the right things, even when you've done everything to help a person, and you expect thanks, if you expect appreciation, if you've put your trust that in that, type of response, you will get hurt. You will get, you know, shaken when you don't get this uh, thank you or the favor of men. Third thing you have to expect is that you will have to expect to be falsely accused. What did they accuse Jesus of? They accused Jesus as a glutton. Sige, kaon, grabe, bulaog. That's what they accused Jesus of. Amazing, isn't it? And Jesus even says, you know what? John the Baptist, he's fasting all the time. What did you accuse John the Baptist? These people. They accused John the Baptist as that of the devil, as that of a crazy man. You know what? Now, I've come and I'm eating. You didn't even know that he was fasting. You tell me I'm now a glutton. I'm a drunkard because I eat and drink wine. And what's even amazing is that these are coming from religious people. The misunderstandings, the unappreciations, the the, the false accusations, they're coming from within the family. They're coming from within the tribe. From the religious leaders even. Expect that this will happen to you. Don't put your trust in them. Don't put, put your trust in circumstances. Put it in the Lord. And it's amazing is this. So most, most important thing tonight, how did Jesus reply to this? Because you know, if you think about it, all He needed to say was this. You know what? I actually fast. I actually teach my disciples how to fast. And that would have been done, right? Because they have come to Jesus and say, Lord, we're fasting and you're not. And if, if Jesus, all Jesus had to say was this, I actually fast, man. And I teach my disciples how to fast. Then the, he would have, these disciples of John was, oh, okay, okay, right? Jesus didn't reply like that. So how, how did Jesus reply? He gives three, he gives three illustrations in his reply. First, he says this, verse 15. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? Think about it. Underline the bridegroom or, or light it up, or whatever. You know how amazing this statement is? The bridegroom? Why would Jesus use this term? 
in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, Isaiah 62 verse 5. The word God here is Elohim. Elohim, God, will rejoice over you as a bridegroom. Here's the word. The bridegroom rejoices over his bride. So God is saying, I'm the bridegroom. My chosen people will be my bride. In Hosea, this is now Yahweh, another name of the Lord. And he's saying, I, Yahweh, will make you my wife. So he, God is the groom, and His chosen people is the bride. And John the Baptist recognizes that. He's saying, you know what? Remember the story? His, his disciples come to him and say, you know what? Jesus, the Messiah, He's starting a competing ministry. We're being affected. We're dwindling down. And Jesus and John the Baptist is saying this amazing truth. He's saying, that's what I want. It is Jesus is the bridegroom. He has come. You know how amazing that is? That blows your mind if the disciples of John listened to it and connected it with Elohim, with Yahweh. And Jesus now says, and John, their master, their disciple, then even says, that's the bridegroom. Now, Jesus himself confirms it. I am the bridegroom. Why would they fast while I'm here? God, Emmanuel, is here with the disciples. And yet, amazing, no? How blind we could be to our religious rituals. How they didn't even see that. They were just offended that Jesus wasn't doing according to how they saw religion should be lived out. That's why Jesus has been teaching in these days, in, his, in Matthew, there is only one true religion, and everything is false. Jesus answers this, how can the guest of the bridegroom, the God, mourn while he is with them? Who are the guests? The disciples. How could the guests, because what's going on here? Jesus is saying, the time will come. There will come a time when the bridegroom will be taken away, then they will fast. So what Jesus is saying, there is a certain degree, while I am here on earth with them, they won't fast. They won't need to. The bridegroom is here. There is a occasion. You know what that means? It's this, that even fasting and every religious ritual that we do or worship that we do for the Lord, every act that we do, it is a response based on a living relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot box it in in simply doing a ritual or a, um, a form of tradition. It would be like, imagine with me this, that, uh, there is a husband and a wife. They've been married for a long time, let's say 50 years. And every morning, the wife, without fail, would wake up early in the morning, would go to the kitchen, would, would boil some hot water, would, would mix some coffee, right, and serve it to her husband every day, every morning, without fail. Amazing, right? So you could say, wow, what a wonderful love story. But one day, the husband asks his wife of 50 years, darling, why do you always prepare coffee for me in the morning? And imagine... What would you feel if the reply of the wife was this? Oh, moman akong daandan, moman ang gitudlo sa akong lola, akong lola, moman akong gitudlo, kung gitudlo ako ni Buhaton, mag-wild man ka, moman akong akong duty, no? basta asawa, ani man gitudlo. So, what's going on? For 50 years of selfless sacrifice, of a ritual, hasn't it just lost all its flavor because the wife hasn't been doing this act of service in response to a loving, living relationship. The wife has just simply done it out of a duty, just simply a ritual. Why? Because that's what she, she was taught. That's what a wife, in her imagination, that's what a wife should be doing. Isn't it the same with the Lord? That when you now 
put your, your trust and faith in a ritual or just do it automatically. You don't even know. Why, why do you get baptized? Why would you dedicate your baby? You know, even ceremonies like baby dedication, they've become a ritual. And the, what's dangerous is that many parents go, go to pastors and, and priests and say, can you dedicate my baby? Meaning, if you dedicate my baby with this religious tradition, the baby will be saved. We'll go to heaven. Tradition will not save us. That's what Jesus is saying. He say, he's saying to the, the disciples of John, why would we fast? This is a living relationship. There is an occasion here. It would be like me inviting you to my, the, the, a birthday, right? My, my 100th day or year birthday. Everybody should be festive, right? It's a great celebration. And then you would come to my party and you would be crying. You would be, you would be wearing all sorts of uh, pambalai, right? And you would be saying, this is the saddest day of my life. And you would be craw- crying and you would be telling people, oh, don't eat. Why? This is so sad, right? So sad day. What's going on? You would be thrown out of my party, right? Why? We're celebrating here. That's not the right. This is not an occasion to cry and, and be sad. You do that in a funeral. And that's what Jesus is saying. This is a relationship. What we have now is a relationship. We're not based religion. Our religion is not based on traditions or rituals where there's no even no reason. You just do it because that's what you have to do. I'm here. There's no reason to fast, but they will when I go away, when I'm taken away, they will. There will be an occasion then. So it is a response. Worship is a response to a living relationship with Jesus. Now, second illustration he gives is this. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth to an old garment, for the patch will pull away from a garment, making the tear worse. Meaning, the cloth, the old garment, and the new is not compatible. It's the same point he's saying here, neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. It's the same thing. The old wineskin cannot contain the new wine. It needs a new wineskin. Meaning, the old way of relating to Jesus, uh, relating to God, is not compatible with the new way Jesus is saying that's going to be the way from now on. That it would now not be a religion of works wherein you work to win the favor of God. You work, you do something in order to be cleansed and forgiven. Jesus is saying it is now going to be based on a relationship. Simply by faith alone, you enter into this relationship. And there is no way the two, way, the two forms of religion was compatible. Even the religion of John's disciples were not compatible with what Jesus is saying to be the new one, to be the true and only religion. You see, in, the, in, in verse 16, the old garment, let me point you back to Matthew 5.20. And Jesus, in the Sermon of the Mount, if you remember with me, this is Jesus preaching and he's saying, unless your righteousness ex- extends or is greater than the teachers of religious law or that even the Pharisees, you won't go to heaven. And you could include the disciples of John here, unless your righteousness exceeds. So why am I saying that the old garment is a form of righteousness, the righteousness of the Pharisees? Because in Matthew 22, verse 11 and 12, Jesus gives a parable, a story. And here he says that there is a garment. He's saying here, when the king came in to meet with the guests, and we can know that it is the God and the guests are the ones that he's inviting to the, to the party, the banquet. He noticed a man who wasn't wearing proper clothes for a wedding. You know what? During this time, the king was handing out garments for the guests to wear. And somehow, this person goes to the party wearing his old garment, wearing his own clothes. And the old garment we know is a form now of righteousness. Meaning, the man had come 
with his own way of righteousness, his own religion, his own way of trying to go to the party, to attend to the party. You know what God said? You know what the king said? I don't. Why, why are you not dressed in the robes of righteousness I have given? And he throws this man out to a dark place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that is hell, my dear friends. The old way, the old garment was in no way going to be acceptable to God. The old garment of trying to achieve righteousness on your own works through a form of religious rituals and traditions, identifying to a nation or a family, it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to please God. Meaning, the new relationship with Jesus is this, that your righteousness will now come from believing in Him alone. It will no longer be based on works, but on faith alone. Second illustration is the new wine, right? And we know in Matthew 26 that Jesus is saying the wine is His blood that will pay for the covenant. So Him dying on the cross would pay for the new covenant that would be set between God and His people. And who would be His people? Everybody now that would believe in Jesus Christ and what He has done on the cross, that He died and on the third day He rose again and, and uh, triumphant over sin and death and now sits at the right hand of God. And everybody that would call upon the name of Jesus, believes in Jesus, will be saved. And the new wine and the new covenant would not be compatible with the way, the old way, the pharisaical way, the way the disciples of John the Baptist did it. And in the context of this passage that we have, the context of fasting, that means, my dear friends, that the new wine includes a new way of fasting. That this would no longer be a fasting based on uncertain future, a fasting based on trying to win the approval of God, this would be a fasting based on the reality that Jesus has come, the bridegroom has come and paid for all our sins and has promised to return triumphant and all of us would be, would be taken down to, to Him. And so this is now a fasting wherein there is hope, hope of an established truth that Jesus Christ, our Savior, has has already finished everything for us. And everything that we face now in desperation, we come to the Lord in fasting. Yes, there is also a saying, Lord, come, come quickly. Lord, we know you can keep all promise because you have already done all these things for us. That is the difference of the new wine and a new kind of fasting that these Pharisees, these sons, uh, these scribes, or even the disciples of John did not understand in their way, in their old way of fasting. So I'll close with this. The new covenant changes everything. The way we relate to God and the way God relates to us, even in the act of fasting. Two months ago, my son drew this, uh, drew us a, 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 a drawing with his crayons. And for you, maybe it would be just a mumbo, mumbo jumbo. You don't understand what that is and all that. I don't, you don't, you don't, some of you might not even appreciate the picture, but for me, you know what? That is a work of art. And I don't, I'm not saying that it is a work of art because. The lines are perfect. The spellings are even right. You know, love, love time. That's, that's his love, his, his spelling right now of love. <laughs> he calls love, love time. What is our love, love time in our family? In our family, love, love time is this. Every uh, 9 o'clock or before, 30 minutes before he has to go to sleep, we spend time as a family doing what we, my dad used to do for us when we were kids. We would wrestle with him. We would play with him. Now we have Shobe. We would play uh, the four of us. We'd read Bible stories to him. We'd share the gospel to him. 
uh, we'd tell him about Jesus, we'd tell him how to pray, and teach him all things, you know. And it, it, this is a precious time for him. And so he, he, draws, he, he drew this for us. For, and he's saying, and, and for me, when he made this, it's not even perfect, right? It's, it's not even all these wrong spellings and, and all this. But for me, this is, this, is, this is so wonderful. This made me so happy. Not because the drawing is perfect, but because He's my son. Because of our relationship. That everything He does now, I am happy. I'm proud of Him. He's, he pleases me. Why? Because of our relationship. The new and real and vibrant living relationship with God, that's the same. That it is now long, no longer doing things for God, trying to win His approval. He already is, has our approval. He's already given us our approval. Why? Because all those who will believe in Jesus will now have a real living relationship with the Father. And you are now acceptable and pleasing before Him. Wonderful, wonderful God. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you so much that even in this, we get encouragement. Even in the analogy of you being a bridegroom, that blows and takes our breath away, blows our mind. That it is God Himself would take us. And we're not even that beautiful in the first place. But because of your grace and love, you who made us your family, you who gave us your only son, Jesus, to die in our place. May you be glorified and magnified, Lord, in everything and every moment of our lives. Teach us to love you and not to just base our idea of religion, of trying to, get to win you in a form of traditions or misplaced loyalties, O oh Lord. And if there is anybody here tonight that needs to repent from those, I pray that you would grant them repentance. Thank you so much, Lord, that you are our bridegroom, our Father, our God. In Jesus' name, amen.